Please welcome and a big applause for David Dahl. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good. The guy at the top row can hear me, so then everyone can hear me, hopefully. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Java or uh, JRuby. I know, controversial topic. Um, but to, to start off, um, I, uh, I'm a senior, senior developer at a company called BERT uh, from Gothenburg, Sweden. And we do analytics for online advertising. Uh, and we do this using Ruby uh, and most specifically, mostly JRuby. Uh, and we do this all on AVS. So that's our, that's our case, and that's sort of the story I'm going to try to tell today. Um, just, just sort of the crash course of what we do. We take something like this, uh, just to say, uh, this particular site is pretty horrible. Like, like you can see, there's pretty much just ads. Um, and that's our, pretty much our goal, to try to make online advertising a viable thing that people don't hate. Uh, and that actually works and the publisher can make money from so they can produce good content. Uh, so we, by, we start by trying to make sure that publishers know what they're selling. Um, so we take some, something like, like this, uh, we turn it into something like this, and then we turn it into something like this. So we track ads and we make pretty graphs. Uh, shouldn't be so hard, right? Um, when, when we got started, we were, um, did what pretty much most people do in the start. We, we wrote everything that we logged into a database, and then we created things for every report, and it broke down on our first major campaign. No surprises there. Uh, so we realized that we probably need to pre-calculate everything. Um, and that's a lot of calculations. And when we got started, uh, we, had, we did all of this in one major application. Uh, that made it extremely scary to deploy. Uh, and, and at this time, we were also still on MRI. So well, well, there are bottlenecks with that. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics on that part. Uh, but we realized that we had to do something uh, different. We have to ch had to change what we do. So we came up with an idea that sort of looks something not at all like this. Um, I mean, hot pink is like the best color for doing architectural scales, uh, skin sketches, right? Um, where imagine that every dot here is one application uh, or one service. And once ser every service do, do something specific, and then we send send data along uh, along the pipeline and ev for every service the data gets more and more refined uh, until eventually we end up with nice metrics uh, that we can print our, in our web applications. Um, and but one big thing here that even though there's like one dot uh, the most important lesson for building a distributed system is to always start with at least two of everything. Because then you've solved the hard problem. Because uh, going from one to two is seriously hard. But going from two to three or to 400, that's, that's easy once you've solved the distributed part of the problem. Um, but we started to implement something like this. And we got stuck because we were still on MRI. And we had this idea that we were going to separate and buffer things with RabbitMQ which uses event machine. And we were going to store stuff with MongoDB. Operations to MongoDB are blocking operations. And if you've tried that together, um, bad things are going to happen. Uh, because Ruby doesn't really have threading. You can't really do two things at once in, in MRI. Um, so we sort of took a long, hard thing. and. Uh, try to figure out what we were going to do. Um, so we thought maybe we should do, move to Java and take like bite in this sour apple and just 
take the punch. Because, uh, you know, you get things like threading. Um, and it's sort of, I mean, enterprise is sort of a bad word in, in this community. But it doesn't have to be. It's, I mean, enterprise means that it's proven. Um, and the amount of libraries for Java is, is really good. I mean, Ruby has a lot of libraries, but Java has a whole lot more, actually. Uh, and a lot of them are proven for very high uh, performant applications. This sort of describes the, the Java ecosystem. You think of something that you want to do, you really realize that something, someone already did it, and then you just move along and be happy. But then we realized that, hey, there's this thing called JRuby. Um, maybe we should look at that, because we'll get threads. We got a real garbage collector. We'll get things like just-in-time compilation. Uh, we get pretty much every Java Scala and Ruby library ever made. Uh, and we started on this path and we realized that, hey, wrapping Java libraries is kind of fun. Um, and you get the benefit of not hating yourself while you code. So this was, this, this was fine and dandy, and we, we realized that, well, okay, this is the way uh, that we want to go. Uh, so then we looked at what kind of challenges do we have. Uh, well, we knew what kind of challenges we had, but the, these, are, these are the challenges. And pretty much we, we, can, we can never be down, because we, we track advertiser, uh, adver advertisement, and we do this... Um, completely invisible to the visitors on, on, your, on, on your page. So there's nothing like people will, if, if something fails, people will reload the page. That doesn't happen. We, we need to always receive data. But we can pause because we don't, what we do is not latency dependent. We don't need to um, respond quickly. As long as we can receive data and just say, that the web server that receives data just answers 200 and says oh, everything is fine, that's okay. And then we can just buffer and wait and process things in our own time. And since we run a, a major application that uh, is spanned over something like 100 AVS instances, we don't really want to fail on unexpected errors just all the time because uh, that would be seriously annoying. Um, but it is okay to die at times. And it, it is okay because if you have an architecture where you buffer things, uh, it is okay for your application to die and then you can restart it. You can figure out what went wrong, uh, fix that problem and, and move along as long as that doesn't take too much time because you can easily build up a couple of gigabytes of data in your buffers in say 10 minutes, and that can be scary pretty quickly. Um, so buffering um, was the way to go, and we, um, we realized that we, we really love RabbitMQ. Uh, it is a seriously awesome application, pretty much the architectural choice that we've made that we were the mo most happy with. And, and this whole thing of splitting things into isolated services comes very natural with, with a queuing system in between. And it also gives you the advantage of decoupling operations in your services. So you really have to think about the interface between your services and how you're going to represent your data when it's not inside your application. Uh, and one thing that you want to think about when you add a buffering, buffering layer is uh, how the, so to speak, transaction with, with acting towards your queuing system and persisting things in the other end of your application are gonna work. Because um, you can't really do it in a transaction that you can roll back. Well, you can, but it's really, really tricky if your application dies. So um, what you do is that you figure out if you want to do things at most one time or at least one time. So you figure out, uh, do I want to acknowledge this message backwards 
after I've sent it along or before I send it along? Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so if, if you, you receive a, your application receives a message and then you're going to do something with that and you're going to persist that to, to a database. Uh, either you uh, persist it before or after you acknowledge your message. So if you die during persisting to the database, for example, you will either get that message one extra time or you're guaranteed to never get any duplicates, but you might lose data. Uh, and if you can make your operations idempotent so that your, uh, if you get duplicates of a message and you will never duplicate that operation, that is fantastic. But that's like a whole different uh, discussion just dealing with idempotency. So, uh, I might get back some other conference to talk about that. <laughs> Just a quick thing about databases and, and the, the databases that we use. Um, we learned this the hard way that uh, it's quite important to pick the right tool for the job. We started by using MongoDB everywhere. And if you heard any one of our guy, uh, us from BERT talking about MongoDB, you'll know that we sort of hate it, but we also love it very, very much. Um, because in the right place, MongoDB can be absolutely fantastic. But in the wrong place, you will spend three weeks, uh, 24 hours a day, just sitting watching the numbers run across the screen and, and shitting yourself. <laughs> One of the uh, new uh, members of our database family is Cassandra. Cassandra is pretty much black magic. Um, it's it's mind-bogglingly complex and, and absolutely awesome. Um, uh, but it's way, very, very Java-centric, uh, which for some is a good thing, and for some it isn't. Um, Redis is also a pretty, very nice thing. Uh, so th these are all databases that I recommend um, in one way or the other. But there's also an option which I like to call NoDB, uh, which is to keep things streaming. Don't store anything, just uh, keep it streaming. Uh, and if you don't acknowledge things as, uh, until you've sent them along, you only need to store things in memory. <laughs> all right, let's talk about code and Java. Uh, this is... If, if you want to build distributed systems, uh, this is the place where you're going to spend most of your time. Uh, Java Util Concurrent is a really, really awesome library. And it pretty much has everything you need. And if you want to take a shortcut, this is one of the books that y you should read. Um, it's the book that I wish I had read before starting to build most of these things. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Um, executors um, is a really easy way of doing um, threading that works really, really well in Ruby. Um, you can submit a block, uh, just specify a size, um, maybe something uh, in relation to the amount of cores that you have on your machine, and then you just submit blocks, or you implement a run method on your class and you submit uh, objects of that class, and everything just works fine, um, except when it doesn't. Um, we had actually had a problem with a um, where the JRuby interpreter uh, accidentally interpreted our method, our classes as some as I think it was it wasn't runnable, which is the interface in Java. Um, but so but. Weird things can happen, but uh, most of the time it doesn't. So don't uh, get scared uh, just because bad things happen to us. Um, blocking queues is another great thing in uh, Java Duty Concurrent. And it gives you a really easy way of doing like a producer uh, consumer pattern. But the important thing is to think about back pressure. I'm going to get back to what back pressure means. Um, but you pretty much, you create like a link blocking queue or an array blocking queue. Um, and then it's really nice. You can do, 
you can try to get data or put data with a timeout so you can actually react if you don't uh, you're if you're not unable to get data or put data on your queue um, or you can do totally blocking operations so your thread will block uh, until there's room in the queue and to get back to back pressure say you have uh, a very simple application that looks something like this you have uh, you take in data and you you acknowledge you create some kind of state and then you put that state on a queue uh, and then you read that that queue in another thread and you persist things into a database what happens if with what happens with your queue if the persistence thread starts to get slow like if your database can't keep up keep up um, if you do as the previous example and just create a, a, a blocking queue that's unbounded so you're gonna start to run out of memory sooner or later because that queue is just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then you're gonna crash so this is a very easy way to implement back pressure into that example you just add a size to that uh, to that blocking queue um, that way, if your queue goes full, your, your, your input thread is just going to get stuck until you've sort of cleared away items from the queue. Um, this is also a lesson that we've learned the hard way, because uh, back pressure, uh, if, if you don't think about it, it will come back to bite you if you do start to do threading things. <clears throat> Other interesting things in in java Google concurrent you have atomic uh, atomic uh, boolean atomic integer atomic long um, you have concurrent maps as, such as concurrent hash map um, and these are i mean having a, a shared mutuals uh, shared mutable state between threads is really tricky uh, and java just solves these things for you um, Count on latch and semaphore are very good ways of, of uh, using distributed locks if you want, uh, if you need that. If you want, if you need, say you want need to wait for a couple of threads to die before you, uh, if, before your application shuts down. Um, Google Guava is a really nice library. Um, it's pretty much Google looked at. Java Util Concurrent and thought that, hey, we missed these things. And then they built that and they released that for everyone to use. Uh, things like caches, multi-maps, uh, more kind of atomics, um, stuff like that. Uh, LMAX Disruptor is a really crazy library. Uh, high performance, low latency, inter-thread messaging library. Uh, basically, it's built for um, real-time trading uh, and it has very 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 low latency um, and it's also something that could be worth looking at if you want to build high-performance JRuby applications but basically to sum it up the easy way of doing uh, multi-threading in, in JRuby is uh, to re realize that thread safety is hard uh, realize that clever people have already thought about these things and just use Java Util Concurrent. Uh, avoid shared mutable state if possible. And think about back pressure. <clears throat> Some other things that are interesting to look at. Um, actors. How, how many have heard of actors? All right, cool. Um, Akka is a concurrency library in, in Scala, uh, which is very most famous for, for its actor implementation. Um, we've made it fairly easy to use by with a small Ruby wrapper called Mika. Um, apparently Mika is like a glacier close to the Akka uh, massive uh, something. Uh, I don't remember. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, this is how easy it is to implement a, a ACA actor using Mika. Um, 
there are some examples. Uh, Mika is not being actively maintained. Um, so if one of you would like to maintain it, just <laughs> call me. Um, Storm is really cool. How many heard of Storm? No one? Oh, like one, two guys. Okay. Um, Storm is pretty much the, um, if you remember the, the pink dots, Storm pretty much does all the arrows for you, so you just do the dots. Uh, it does uh, distribution and, and everything. And it's, um, they got bought by Twitter, I think. Uh, I don't remember the exact, um, the exact story. Uh, but there's a, a uh, yes? Well, yeah, um, RabbitMQ is, uh, well, I, I, can, I can get back to you on that afterwards. I think it's better um, because we, um, th there's a, a Ruby library called Redstorm, which abstracts away a lot of the things that Storm does. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to use, um, but Storm didn't work for us. And um, that's because our branching factor is too high, which means that for every item that we put into this magic box that Storm provides, we get like um, a couple of hundred operations out of it. And we need to wait for all of those operations to be persisted before we can acknowledge backwards. backwards. And that just cost a massive overhead in terms of, of uh, acknowledgement tree, um, which is one of the things that Storm does. And it does it pretty good, but it didn't work for us. But that's not a reason for you to not try it. And I, I seriously encourage every one of you to, to get and download Red Storm and just try things because it's, it's really clever and it does a whole bunch of really cool things. Um, and lastly, for the, like the holy grail of big data processing is Hadoop. How many heard of Hadoop? All right, that's better. Um, and we, my colleague Theo wrote a uh, library called, well, a gem called RubyDoop, which is a, um, also a very nice abstraction for writing Hadoop jobs in, in JRuby. You can, Implement, you implement the mapper and a reducer, and you just implement the method map or reduce, and then you do a set up a job, you specify the input and the output, and uh, then you can pretty much run it. Um, then, I mean, then there's the whole issue of the Hadoop infrastructure and versions and everything. Um, but that's a whole different discussion. I mean, just if, if you want a really big mindfuck, look at the uh, versioning of Hadoop. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and, whoa, I'm actually finished bef faster than I thought. Good. Then I have time for some questions. Uh, just a quick mention of some other cool things that um, we've done. Uh, small, mostly small Ruby wrappers around Java libraries. Hot Bunnies, which is uh, the uh, wrapper we wrote around the Java library for RabbitMQ. Uh, we, it's, it's nowadays maintained by the same guy who maintains the AMQP gem for, for Event Machine. Uh, Eurodice is a uh, wrapper for the Cassandra library uh, PLOPS. Uh, Somehow, uh, my colleagues have uh, taken to, to liking uh, German names. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, I did not come up with this name, neither of these names, actually. Uh, Bundesstraße is a library wrapping uh, zero MQ. Uh, and Multimeter is a library wrapping uh, Yammer metrics, which is pretty, pretty nice. Um, and that's all I got. So we got four more minutes.
minutes for questions. No questions, seriously. Okay, I have a question regarding uh, Hadoop and committing uh, uh, jobs in Ruby. Yeah. The actual performance, because, uh, well, in theory at least, uh, Java is uh, much faster than Ruby executing stuff. So I'm, I'm wondering how does it work in practice? Is it really that much slower than using raw Java or, or not? Yeah, uh, so the question is uh, is JRuby? A lot fast, a lot slower than than Java uh, for running Hadoop, or in, or in general, actually. Um, yeah, in, in, in Hadoop, uh, uh, but but that's. I think the the big question is there uh, is about the performance of JRuby on the JV, JVM versus Java on the JVM. And yes, JRuby on the JVM is slower, uh, but it's not much slower. And for us, the argument has been that. With the things we do, um, it's much more important to, to be able to implement things faster. And also, what we do, we, we need to scale horizontally. We need to add more machines instead of getting the most performance out of one machine. And that's the same thing with Hadoop, actually. That you, you need to be able to uh, scale things at, with more machines. And uh, sure, with, with, if you're running things on, like, um, the, what's it called? Uh, Elastic MapReduce on AVS, for example, where you pay by the hour, then your performance uh, by by the your bang for the buck, so to speak, that that's going to be an issue. But it's it's not from what we've learned. It's not that much slower, uh, and if you can save five hours. By not by writing Ruby instead of Java, uh, that's five hours that you can instead pay for on Hadoop. So it's sort of a trade-off that we find is worth it. It might not be worth it for some applications, but it is for us. Any other questions? <laughs> I mean, I could I could talk about Mongo or whatever uh, as well. Are you using some add-ons on Hadoop, like as cascading or? We, we don't do very much Hadoop uh, right now. We, we mostly do real-time uh, processing. We've started to do Hadoop things in the last couple of months. So right now we don't really use any, any extras, so to speak. Mm, yeah. So when you use um, RabbitMQ as a buffer, uh, do you have any persistence, or is it yes. purely in memory? No, it's we we persist everything, uh, because otherwise you, you wouldn't feel safer uh, using it as a buffer. If the machine goes down, you're yeah, pretty screwed. That it could, like the buffer could fill up very quickly, and uh, then you would start losing data otherwise. Right? Yeah, uh, but uh, RabbitMQ has been become a lot better in the last couple of versions. I think it's up to 2.8 now. They they actually had the the back pressure problem that I mentioned earlier. They had they had that in 2.6 and earlier. So you could if you, if you started to push things too fast onto RabbitMQ, you would you you would lose all uh, all speed in trying to get things out of that queue. So you would pretty much just fill up all your memory and your machine would crash. Last question. So you said that you build Bundesh Tessa as a wrapper around zero MQ. Yes. What do you use zero MQ for? Uh, right now we use that for as an alternative to RabbitMQ for uh, inter-process communication that doesn't need to be well. Where we we use it where we don't need to just push data from one point to another, but actually have communication between two nodes. Uh, as so more like an alternative to doing a uh, HTTP interface uh, instead. Okay, big thanks to David. Thank you.